Welcome folks to our midweek. It's lovely to have you joining with us. And tonight we're coming to our last in our studies in the book of Ruth. A new series will be starting uh, next week. Just a few things to remind you of. Prayer time at half past eight. I really love to see more folk joining us for this Zoom prayer time. Uh, as I say on Sunday, you can come and not even show your face, but join in with us. And if you haven't got the link, even email me uh, after you listen to this teaching and I'll send you the link for that meeting at half past eight. If you're not able to join us on that, please pray at your own in your own home at half eight for the needs of a church and particularly for the movement of God's spirit in these days among believers and the unsaved uh, also at this time. Also just to remind you that on Saturday night we're having a church prayer meeting so that's open for everyone at 8 p.m. And a friend of mine who is a Presbyterian army chaplain will be coming to share about something of his work. And so that's on Saturday evening at 8 o'clock. And then there'll be time of prayer after, indeed, uh, the chaplain shares. So we're going to look here at the Book of Ruth once more. And let's just commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray together. Father, we come to your word. We come to your truth now and ask, O oh Lord, that... We would know your grace and help, Father. This is a, a wonderful book. It's a book which speaks tremendously about your providence. How in the situations of life you work out, Father, things for the good of your people, even difficult and challenging things. In the situations of life, Father, you're working out your purposes and plans of salvation. And we just pray that tonight, Father, through this study, we would just be encouraged to trust you fully and to Indeed, obey you with all our hearts. Help us to just have hearts that will worship and praise you for the great and amazing God you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's read together Ruth chapter 4, beginning from verse 1. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to a relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, Buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if, if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one beside you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm transaction. The one drew off his sandal and gave it the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders, and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilian and to Malin. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malin, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrapha and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. 
Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighbourhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Abinadab. Abinadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. Amen. Now as we look at this chapter here tonight, we're going to do it under the title, The Redeemer. And tonight the story of Ruth, this fascinating story, comes to a conclusion. And we see something more of the the richness of God's wisdom, love, which are displayed as he acts in such a gracious way in this story. And the first thing as we think about the Redeemer here is the Redeemer who is willing. Remember the term Redeemer means to buy back. Last time Boaz had promised Ruth at the threshing floor that he would respond to her request for him to take her under his care. Now the, the background here are two laws which we mentioned last time which provide for the widows and the poor in Israel at that time. There is first of all the, the Leveret law. This was when the closest male relative would marry the widow to take on the responsibilities of the, the person who was deceased and see that the name of the deceased would continue in the next generation. Indeed, the child, sorry, the first child that would be born would indeed carry on that name. Also, there is the law of the kinsman redeemer. And this was buying back those who had become slaves or the buying back the land of those who had sold their land because they were in so much poverty. So those two laws of the leveret and the kinsman redeemer are in the background here of this story. Now remember, Boaz had said that he would act as a kinsman redeemer for Ruth and for Naomi, but that there was a closer male relative who would have a greater legal right to this first and he needed to be consulted. And so Boaz comes to the gate of the gates of Bethlehem where legal transactions were carried out and discusses the matter with his closer relative and in the presence of ten elders. Let me just say as a wee aside that the gates of the city, cities were very compact. There wasn't much space within the wee narrow streets and that. And there wasn't much space. So at the gates were people would have met to for markets, where people would have met for their council and so forth to discuss important legal matters. And remember what Jesus said, that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And there are different ways to interpret what he meant by the gates of hell. But the gates were people planned and plotted and schemed. And so when Jesus says, he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He could very well be meaning the place where the forces of hell plot and scheme. Their schemes will not succeed against them. That's just by a we as side. But let's get back here to Boaz as he meets this relative. Now this relative was happy to buy the land that had belonged to Naomi and Elimelech. But when he then realised that his responsibilities would include taking Ruth as his wife. He then became reluctant. He speaks there in verses 5 and 6 that, verse, verse 6, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. And it appears, now, we maybe don't understand all this fully, but it appears that indeed if he had went and married Ruth, and then they had a child, certainly the first child, would be classified as the son of Ruth's former husband. And he didn't want this. He didn't want to jeopardise his own legacy, his own 
a future inheritance what would happen he had his own plans he was happy if he could act in a convenient way in regards to buying the land but when taking on the role of redeemer would jeopardize his own plans for the future and his own plans for a family and so forth he was not willing to do this this man was an unwilling redeemer when he considered the cost and how different he is here from Boaz. Boaz was so different. We have already considered how he was so caring, so generous in his actions to Ruth at the time of gleaming, allowing her indeed to be fed and to stay with the, the ladies who work for Boaz, even getting them pull out extra uh, stalks and stuff so that she could gather even more grain at that time. So he was a very caring man indeed. So different indeed from this other relative who was looking after himself. Now, as we consider the differences in these two men, I think what we see here is that doing the right thing will in the end pay off. The relative who was reluctant was concerned about his name being preserved. He was concerned that the first child would carry on the name of Malin, Ruth's dead husband. Boaz, on the other hand, he didn't seem to have any such concerns. And Boaz had no hesitation at all of taking on these responsibilities. And he didn't seem to particularly care about the legacy in regards to his name. But let me ask you this. What was the name of this relative who refused to take on this role? We don't know. This relative who was concerned for his legacy, who was concerned for his name continuing in the next generations, we don't know who he is. His name has not been preserved. We haven't a clue what it was. Whereas Boaz, who wasn't concerned about that, but was more concerned about caring for Ruth and providing for her and her mother-in-law Naomi, we do know his name. And even some children today are named after him. Doing the right thing may seem difficult at the time and the more difficult thing to do at the time, but always in the long run, doing the right thing is the path to blessing. Not always in the short term, but in the long term, that will be the case. In the unwillingness of this closer relative, we have a considerable contrast to the great Redeemer who is Jesus. Jesus is the one who was so willing to sacrifice everything. Cut off from the land of the living. It speaks about in Isaiah 53. Cut off in order to save his people. He gave everything so we indeed could be rescued. Jesus was like Boaz in his picture of willingness and generosity. Except Jesus, of course, would do it on a much greater scale. Think of him in Gethsemane. Think of him as he sweat those drops of blood as he was made aware of something of the cost of being the Redeemer. He prays, not my will, but your will be done. And I think as you follow through the Gethsemane accounts and put the Gospels together, he seems even to pray of even more passion as he prays, thy will be done. He's praying for grace. He's praying for energy to fulfill his role as Redeemer, even though it would cost so much. Always remember this. The devil will want to give you suspicion about the Lord Jesus. But always remember that Jesus is the most willing and generous and most caring redeemer imaginable. He's not tight-fisted. He's not hard-hearted. He's loving. He's gracious beyond anything we can imagine. And if you're not a Christian, Realise this is the most loving and gracious saviour who wants to bless you and give you so much. He is the one that you are refusing and resisting. Oh, how can you resist such a willing redeemer? So we have the redeemer who is willing. And then secondly, we have the redeemer who is righteous. Looking here at verses 7 to 12. In his plan to provide for Ruth, Boaz is very keen that he will do the right thing. He will do it the right way. He made sure that when he spoke to this other relative, it was done in the presence of ten elders who would act 
as witnesses. It's very deliberate there at the stop of the start of this chapter. He got this relative and sat them down. He got these ten elders and sat them down as witnesses. The agreement with the relative included the symbol of the relative giving over the sandal, his sandal in verse seven. That's pretty strange. Uh, it's maybe a wee bit similar. Uh, people used to spit on their hand and shake their hands as well. Maybe something like that. It possibly comes from Joshua 1 and 3, where the Lord said to Joshua, Every place that the sole of your foot will thread upon, I have given to you. God promising this land to his people. And in the relative handing over his saddle to Moses, basically saying, I'm not going to step in this land. I'm not going to claim this land as my own. I'm not going to walk there. I'm going to leave it to you to deal with it yourself. Boaz speaks to the assembled elders that were there saying, listen, you're witnessing what's happening here. You see this. You're witnesses this, verses 9 to 10. Again, it's very deliberate. He's saying, you're witnesses that I'm buying the land. I'm taking Ruth to be my wife. You're witnesses this. And the elders confirmed it in verses 11 to 12 and add their blessing into that. Boaz not only did the right thing, he made sure that it was seen to be done in the right way. Now, let me just say something about marriage here. Some people have said, you know, marriage really is no different for two people just coming to live together. But it's not the same. Some people have said, well, it's just a piece of paper. It's not the same. Marriage is, a, as we see here, it's, it's a public and it's a legal commitment of a man and a woman to each other for life. That is what marriage is. And let me say to anybody who may be listening to this who's not married and you're living with your, your, your girlfriend or boyfriend, why will you not get married? Don't let the idea of a big wedding. It costs about 40 quid to get married. That's the price of a, a license. Marriage is the commitment of two people together before God for life and before witnesses. So why won't you do that? Does that person you live with or maybe you have children with, are you not going to be committed to them? Why not do the biblical pattern and know God's blessing through this? As we think of Boaz here being the Redeemer, a righteous Redeemer, doing everything the right way, this of course points to Jesus and his role as a Redeemer. Boaz as a Redeemer fulfilled God's law. He made sure everything was done right by God's law. And Jesus was the same. Jesus spoke of how he had come, not to abolish, but to fulfill the law of God. And Jesus would fulfill God's law in two ways. He would fulfill it by his life of perfect obedience, keeping all of God's law through his life. So much so in John 17, Jesus could pray to the Father just before he was arrested, all that you've given for me to do, I have done it. He perfectly obeyed God's law. The second way he fulfilled the law alongside his life of perfect obedience was his sacrificial death. The sin of his people, failing to keep God's law, required death, required sacrifice. It deserves hell itself. And that is what Jesus endured on the cross. Not just the physical pain of the cross, but those who would die on a tree, it's, the Bible says, would be cursed. It was the cursing of God. It was the wrath of God upon his soul. It was hell itself he experienced on that cross. And so Jesus kept the law in two ways. He kept the requirements of the law in his life of obedience, which we have all failed to do. He did it as a substitute so we could be saved. And then he kept the requirements of the law in regards to his death for those, what they deserve for breaking his law. And so Jesus has come to do the right thing. And when Jesus was hanging on the cross and he cried, it is finished. He says, I've done it. I've done everything the law requires. I've fulfilled it perfectly. And it's only by Jesus fulfilling the requirements of the law. In other words, the requirements of God and his justice perfectly. Can we be saved? We can't fulfill it ourselves. You try and keep the Ten Commandments even for a week. Try it. You'll never get there. But Jesus perfectly fulfilled God's law in his life and in his death. The Redeemer who is righteous. 
And then thirdly, we have the Redeemer who gives in verses 13 to 17. Boaz's marriage to Ruth brings both love and security into Ruth's life, but also into the life of Naomi, her mother-in-law. Naomi, whose position was very vulnerable when she came back, now has security and a loving family around her. The birth of a son for Ruth adds to that security for Naomi. Uh, most of the section here contains what the local women said to Naomi at this time. If you look there at verses 14 to 15. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. And the Redeemer spoken about here, actually it wasn't Boaz. The Redeemer spoken about here is Obed, the baby that is born to Ruth. Obed is called a Redeemer because of the hope, the security that he will bring to Naomi in the future and particularly in her old age. Remember, there's no social security. And indeed, if you weren't able to work, who is going to provide you? You needed family who would bring you security. And so this, this grandson would indeed provide that and care for her. It just reminds us to the importance that we have to, to care for our families. You know, so often people want to abdicate everything and just basically think the state is responsible for family. There are times, you know, when we aren't able to look after our loved ones, it's too much. But we, we are called to do what we can and to show love and care for those who are in our family. It's shocking if someone professes the name of Christ and doesn't have a loving care for their relatives. The name Obed means to serve and appears it was the local women who indeed gave him that name <laughs> that's quite interesting isn't it and so Obed said he's come to serve you anyway he's God's gift to you to help provide for your needs remember how Naomi spoke when she came back to Bethlehem she said she had left Bethlehem full with her husband and her two sons and then she had come back empty husband dead two sons dead but now she who had lost so much now so much has been given to her. Now she's full again. Now there's a, a richness has been restored into her life. It has happened as Boaz has showed love and kindness to Ruth in taking her under his wing in their marriage and is blessed by God indeed with this child. Look at verse, uh, verse 16 there. I think it's lovely. Then Naomi took the child and led him on her lap. And became his nurse. There's she holding the, the little baby. She's nursing that little child. Just imagine the joy, the happiness that's now in her life after so much trial. And then finally we have the Redeemer who is planned in verses 17 to 22. We can look at the story of Ruth as a very personal story of what was God was doing in this one family. But as Sinclair Ferguson puts it so well in his book, on this uh, book of Ruth, he says, God was multitasking. With God, there's always more going on than we can ever see or even imagine. God is up to so much more good than we grasp. And the last verses speak of the family line, which would go through Ruth's son Obed to Boaz to Obed, and then from Obed to Jesse, and then to David, King David, who would be Obed's this little baby's grandson. Remember how Judges 21 and verse 25. Judges immediately comes before Ruth. The book of Ruth is set in the time of Judges. And Judges 21 and 25, the last verse of that book of Judges, it said this. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It was a mess. The country was a mess. There was no leadership. There was no one directing them in the right way. And we see in the book of Ruth what's happening as the book of Ruth ends with the name David. The very last word in the book of Ruth is the word David. 
God is providing leadership. God is, has a plan at work here to give a shepherd to the people, to lead them in the right way. And here we see that what was going on was not just what was going on in Ruth and Naomi's personal story. God had a much bigger agenda in regards to providing for his people, a redeemer, a, someone who would shepherd and lead them. And of course, the plan is even bigger than what's been mentioned here because from David would come the great descendant, Jesus, the saviour of the world. And so God is multitasking. God is always up to far much more than we can ever imagine. The story of Naomi, Ruth and Boaz in many ways was an ordinary story with ordinary people. But the extraordinary God was working out his purposes in a wonderful way, his plan of salvation. And what is happening around us, it's not just what we can see. There's a bigger picture of what God is up to. And remember this, just don't focus on your life and what's happening in your life. There's a bigger picture of what God's plans are for those you meet, those you come in contact with, those around you. And when you are faithful and do what God wants you to do, you're fitting into his plans and his purposes. Yes, if you're a Christian, you're special to God, but it's not all about you. God has a much bigger plan. For example, you go to a shop and you're frustrated. Somebody has messed up an order. If you think it's all about you, the world just revolves around you, you lose your cool. But you realise it's not all about you. God has a bigger plan. Maybe the plan for that, indeed, shop assistant to become a Christian and you need to be a good witness. It's different. God is up to far more than we could ever imagine. And let us be careful that we look to the bigger picture. God uses ordinary people, ordinary circumstances of life to further his wonderful plan of salvation. And he will use us, not when we're extraordinary, he will use us, ordinary people, in our ordinary lives, in our ordinary everyday things, when we're faithful to him in how we live. May God give us the grace for that. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you so much for this message tonight. We thank you for the, the Redeemer who was willing. And we thank you for the willingness of Christ to come to be our Saviour. We thank you for the Redeemer who was righteous and how Jesus satisfied your justice and fulfilled the law. And indeed, in Jesus, Father, we have, have confidence of being right with you, justified in your sight. We think of the Redeemer who gives and how indeed for Ruth and Naomi that their lives were turned around in such richness and such blessing. And then we think of the Redeemer who has planned and how indeed you have a bigger agenda than what we can see. And indeed, as there's a plan there even that Christ would come one day out of this family. Oh Father, you will use us, you will bless us. Father, as we trust you and are faithful to you give us grace for that lord use us ordinary people our ordinary lives our ordinary everyday activities use them lord as we indeed would seek to be faithful to you so that your great and wonderful purposes will be fulfilled in jesus name we pray amen amen